Welcome everybody to our session on standardization. I'm delighted that you could, you could join us. Um, I'm Ray Walsh from Dublin City University and I'm the chair of the BDVA Standards Group um, and very delighted to be able to welcome uh, some very eminent guests to join us today. Um, the Thomas Ryba is the senior, senior, senior officer at DG Connect at the European Commission. We have Lindsay Frost from NEC Laboratories in Europe and also a member of the Etsy board for standardization. Um, Amelia Tantar from Recording in Progress, Black, Black Swan, uh, Luxembourg. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, the CEO and founder of Hatha Systems, Rama Murthy. Thanks everybody for joining us and what, what to, to get the ball rolling with, with, the, with today's session, uh, I'm just going to do a quick introduction to the, one of the projects that the European Commission has funded through Horizon 2020. And that I'm, I'm happy to be a part of that project with the Stand ICT. And I'm going to give a, a, a quick presentation on Stand ICT and its, um, its body of work, I suppose, that is trying to support European engagement in in international standardization. So as I said, my name is Ray and I am the director of the European Observatory for ICT Standards and the Standard ICT Project 2023 is the project or the vehicle or the instrument for helping us to um, increase engagement with international standardization. Some of the uh, key achievements and, and uh, main parts of what we do with the project is, first of all, the Commission, European Commission has given us through, through the uh, uh, Horizon 2020 uh, framework program, 4 million euro and 3 million euro of that uh, gift has, has been giving back to, I suppose, the, the key, um, key professionals in uh, standards who would engage with international standardization and want to uh, promote and develop standards developments uh, projects uh, worldwide. And we do this this 3 million euros given out through 10 open calls. We're currently up, up as far as the fifth open call, which finished um, yesterday. And out of those, uh, uh, the 10, as I said, five of them are, are complete. The 58 contract, contractualized European or external um, professionals uh, are on our evaluation board. We have seminars and topics, which we run on, on se several uh, times throughout the year, usually every couple of months, we have a webinar around um, a, a key technology area. So the main groups that, that, that uh, are active uh, at the moment uh, would be AI and um, uh, smart cities, digital twin, uh, etc. And we're launching new working groups all the time. We've signed memorandum of understandings with a lot of, of synergy. Uh, synergetic uh, uh, stakeholder groups as well. So the fifth open call uh, is, is closed and the sixth open call will be starting up again soon. Within the European Observatory for ICT Standards, um, we, we released uh, landscape reports. Uh, uh, one has already been released, the uh, landscape report, uh, which gives you the state of the art in terms of international standardization worldwide. And the smart cities uh, in, um, landscape report has been finalized and is about to go to print uh, hopefully next week. We have nine technical working groups and we have an, an academy as well. So we'll a bit more detail on those later. Uh, later. Uh, massive community, uh, 1,331 registered users within the, um, uh, the stand, stand ICT platform uh, and lots of followers and, and uh, various other uh, 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 social media, I suppose, but, uh, people that pick up on our, on our feeds as well. Impact reports, a uh, second one has just been published and the external advisory group, which we'll have a look at in a few minutes. Okay, so uh, we're involved in, as I say, standardization. So we fund what we call fellows, the standard city fellows uh, with grants, and they get involved in developing uh, standards documents and, imp in, and uh, influencing standards policy and strategy worldwide. And the examples here are, are many. So graph query language, you know, um, fiber optics, you know, health related implementations, age assurance, quantum technologies, etc. So lots of our of our, our graduates, our, our fellows uh, get involved in key standards area. And some of these are really senior um, international experts who have been funded through these calls as well. This is a little quick snapshot of, of some of the um, the outputs. So uh, of the uh, submitted 82 applications, a total amount of 925,000 was given between the, uh, the first four open calls. Um, 
uh, there varies between long-term supports and short-term supports. Different organization types are represented, mostly SMEs would apply for funding under these calls, but we also have academics and research in, um, uh, industry uh, centers, etc. And you can see here, there's, there's lots of different types of targeted projects, 5G and 3D printing and uh, Industry 5.0 and ontologies and cloud computing and cybersecurity. And the split between the actual um, development organizations to get funded is, is varied as well. So uh, you have ISO, ISO IEC, Etsy, uh, uh, Sensen, like IEEE, etc. And the gender split, which is uh, something we're trying to open to, to um, uh, be able to uh, change by we're running a, a new and updated um, uh, uh, a webinar for engagement for women in standardization as well. So more about that anyway. The first open call, uh, we attracted, uh, I think it was over 30 fellows funded out of that. And we followed those fellows. We followed their, their work in um, international standards projects. And we've published uh, the outputs of, of their work as well. So you can have a quick look at that. Uh, if you want to just get on the standard cities site and go through to where the Zenodo open access allows you to download um, the uh, impact reports we we published uh, and also download the landscape reports for, uh, for AI. The repository uh, is a key part of the European Observatory, obviously, because you have a list of uh, of all the standards that we, we that we process through our technology working groups. They get uploaded onto a, a common system, and it's, it's possible then to uh, to navigate that system and look for cloud standards or data standards or cybersecurity standards, etc., by searching the repository. And it also gives you a discussion forum where you can actually interact with experts. Uh, even within the technical working groups, if, if you're a member of a technical working group, but also you can inter inter interact with the and discuss with the community as well through the through the European Observatory uh, website here. Um, again, the technical working groups are, are the, the backbone of the European Observatory, and delighted to have a so key key people here, including Amelia and Lindsay, um, in terms of people who are active within the technology working groups um, of the European Observatory, and also again uh, to have um, uh, Thomas Ryba as well, who's who's the who's the our, our main European Commission uh, co coordination person for uh, for Stand ICT. Uh, we have a technical working group on blockchain with Ishmael and artificial intelligence with Lindsay, big data with with, with Demos and Jerome, digital twin. And Antonio, uh, is, who is this, the chair of that group, Matthias is on cybersecurity, Joel is who's just finished the Smart Cities Landscape Report, Sebastian is working on tr trust and information, and then Brian, who's, who's the director of technology standards, HP, Grant Brian runs our, 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 our academy, and our academy is, is uh, involved in, in collating and, and collecting uh, standards training material from all over the world, so from, from, um, from ISO Academy and from JTC1, from um, from Senelec and Etsy, and also from uh, from from NATO actually, because NATO have their own ICT standards training material. And then, as I said, we publish these standards reports out of the European Observatory, and the AI one has been published. The Smart Cities one is just about to be published, and we're well on the way with Digital Twin and Trusted Information as well. So they are due to be published early in the new, in the new year. Um, as I was talking about the Standards Academy, then the, the, there's a, a huge um, uh, expert group involved in contributing to the work of the, the, the Standards Academy. And uh, as I said, Brian is the, is, the, is the chair there, but also have senior senior people uh, from uh, OASIS and, and uh, from uh, Rotterdam uh, University, from national standards bodies, you know, uh, it, conveners of, of uh, technical work groups, uh, sorry, conveners of, of uh, working groups within um, uh, ISO uh, subcommittees. Uh, we have uh, sec, sec gens like from, from the, the digital SME, uh, the SME Alliance, uh, uh, senior managers, uh, other commission representatives, uh, professors from EURAS, the European um, Research Association for Standardization, and, and, and other key contributors on the international stage, you know, uh, who are involved in collating, uh, collecting and and eventually going to to uh, validate some of the materials that, that we can present this standards uh, collateral material in different formats so that we can we can identify them for beginners standards for intermediate users or for advanced users for advanced users would be for standards practitioners who are involved in standards development but beginners and intermediate users 
this would be more for people who, who aren't aware of the impact of standardization that can have on, on a startup or on an SME. And we, we, we'd hope to bring that material um, to, to the public freely available through the standardicity website uh, in the, the coming months. Um, and also have collaborations with, with uh, other large uh, consortia and, and projects within the uh, European uh, ecosystem. So Onto Commons is one uh, where we are working with uh, uh, Onto Commons and, and creating a new technical working group on ontologies. And so in that partnership, then we're going to be looking at uh, uh, representation, sorry, representations from Etsy Sarif and, and ISO and IRDS, OMG, Digital Twin Consortium, etc. All of these organizations would have a view on what standardization needs for, for uh, ontologies would be. And we are, we've just launched, we've just launched that last week, actually, um, the, uh, the ontologies group. As I said before, because of the sort of disparity between the gender uh, balance on, on, uh, within standardization, we're, we're specifically going to address that by running targeted uh, initiatives to, to, it's not that we don't have the experts uh, available, it's just that the, uh, the, the women experts in, in ICT, a lot of them are busy on, on various other directions and we're hoping to engage more on a standardization front um, uh, uh, via, this, via this vehicle. So the solution to this lack of um, uh, availability, I suppose, like, you know, maybe a lot of it's due to awareness. So what we're going to do is, is to raise the awareness of standard city and, and the supports or engagement are, that are, are available for engagement and present that uh, through a dedicated webinar and um, in, engage with, with, with like uh, women in IT and, and uh, women in AI, AI Alliance and lots of other uh, key consortia uh, and, and uh, uh, project groups which, who, who would be able to hopefully help us to, to deliver on our standards agenda uh, and uh, engage with us in our projects. So scouting and contacting, you know, greater than 20 uh, EU structures support women and standards, collaboration with Etsy Sense and IUT for their uh, active female uh, experts, and then having this dedicated webinar, as we said. And that'll become one of our series of, of walk and talk webinars that, that we normally have within the Stanley City. Um, and they, these are many folds so go from education about standards uh, to tr trusted information to artificial intelligence, which, which uh, Lindsay was in, involved in. And Joel is going to be doing one on smart cities. Sorry, Joel has just done one on smart cities. Um, there's a new one coming up soon, uh, and that's on Digital Twin, um, which, will be, which will be launched um, next uh, next. Next week, actually, next week. Uh, this is the latest one. So uh, thanks to uh, Eddie Hartog from, from the, uh, the head of the technology and smart communities at the European Commission for, for getting involved in, in the, that particular one. And, and uh, uh, this, was, this was coordinated by and moderated by our chair, our chair which is uh, Joel Myers. And uh, Joel, Joel is heavily, heavily involved in, in the I IEEE initiative in smart cities and a multiple IEEE uh, um, activities related, related to smart cities. So the fifth open call is, is just closed and the sixth open call will be uh, opening soon. Um, and this is just a, 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 I suppose, a shout out for some of the upcoming uh, talks which are happening in quarter one, uh, the walk and talk, uh, women in ICT standards, and also the fact that we have uh, next month, we have digital twins uh, seminar as well. So there's always active activity uh, on the website. And if you sign up to us then we, uh, or just follow us on, on social media uh, through LinkedIn or Twitter, then you will get access to, to all of this uh, information. So now that, that's it, that's from, from uh, my perspective, that is uh, uh, the setting the groundwork for, for the standardization uh, associated with, with uh, um, the, the project work of, St of Stand ICT uh, in particular. So without any uh, further ado, then what, what I'll do is progress on to the next portion of the, um, this particular session. And that is to uh, invite uh, our esteemed colleague, uh, Thomas Ryba, uh, to present a, a presentation on behalf of, of the European Commission on, on the standardization work from within his field. Thanks very much for joining us, Thomas, and the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, I try to uh, put here my screen on. Okay, uh, we're seeing the backdrop. Yeah, and uh, it's again another screen. <laughs> yep, that's it. That's the correct one. Just need to go in full screen mode. Yep. Perfect. So, uh, sorry, you need to flip. Uh, Switch screens. Flip, probably. I hope it works.
No, that's turned off the main screen. It's the display option on the top uh, left-hand side of the screen. So you're just beside the uh, this show speaker, you have a display at top left. Uh, next one over to the right. Oh, yes. There you go, perfect. Yeah. Thanks a lot. So, uh, yes, uh, thanks, Ray, for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I would like to give you a short update and an overview of what we're doing actually here inside the Commission. Um, here, uh, especially on standardization. So, we have some European specificities uh, on standardizations. We have uh, on one side, the European standardization system, which is actually a success story and has been in operation uh, in Archer in an efficient way, uh, but uh, still has some challenges to make it even better. And uh, we have with that also from the European standardization system, a linkage to international standardization. But uh, here in ICT, the, uh, the main issue is basically that we have many, many foreign consortia, uh, more than 100 foreign consortia worldwide on ICT standardizations. And this is quite important uh, to put them together in a, a homogeneous uh, ecosystem. From the regulatory requirement, uh, the EC can give standardization requests uh, in support of our EU policies or regulations uh, to the European standardizations organizations. A formal standardization request is just done for regulatory activities, but we can also reference standards uh, and specifications others than from uh, the European standardizations organizations and any legal acts if it's agreed by the Council and the European, uh, uh, European Parliament. Then uh, Europe has one uh, part which uh, uh, some parts in the world is quite... Uh, um, so we ha don't have any NIST, so National Institute in Standardization, where we can do some testings and um, where we can see some emerging fields on standardization, for example, on cybersecurity, quantum computing, blockchain, digital ledger technologies, or digital currencies. Nevertheless, we have the NIST and uh, uh, the um, um, Joint Research Center, the GFC, who are helping us on standardizations, especially on um, artificial intelligence, where they're working on uh, mapping, for example, standardizations, uh, which uh, could be referenced uh, in the legal act, which we are uh, preparing on artificial intelligence at this moment. So the current framework, uh, which we are working here inside the commission, we, uh, the, the main part is uh, the regulations on standardization, which is the commission decision um, um, from uh, 2012, and uh, which has established uh, a committee of standards, which you see here um, uh, in the middle, and um, which analyze basically uh, what kind of standardization requests the Commission would like to give to the ESOs in support of uh, the regulations. But they also have other uh, obligations, for example, to see if some of the member states uh, have an objection to uh, harmonize standards, if it's not safe or whatever. Um, on the other side, for ICT, we have the rolling plan, uh, which, uh, which outlines the EU uh, standardization needs in support of our policies and our regulations. So it's a wide document. Uh, you can find this document on join up if you just Google uh, um, rolling plan 2021. It's a new version. There's an, uh, an, an update coming up uh, beginning of next year, the 2022 version. Um, the regulation I mentioned, and in the past, we had this uh, joint initiative on standardizations, uh, where most of the actions are 
uh, had been finalized, but there's still some actions going on where we're doing, for example, a study about the impact on standardizations um, on our economy. But also the, uh, the smart group about stakeholder engagement, which is a mirror group from the Committee of Standards. They're discussing, uh, again, from the industrial side, what's happening um, with the standardization requests. So our challenges is basically the European standardization systems um, needs to be uh, agile and efficient. The development of harmonized European standards for the voluntary presumption of conformity with the EU regulations needs to have the right balance between speed and quality. And the process needs to be conformed to WE criterion, especially uh, for the core principles. And at this moment, we have set up with the European standardization organizations a group, a task force, basically, um, defining how we can make this process uh, quicker and more agile. And um, what we see here in Europe, our strength is the inclusiveness and the broad stakeholder participation from industry, but also from the vertical sector, civil society, SME, governments, uh, representatives, which actually we don't see uh, too much on international standardizations um, like in ITU. So, uh, and then, uh, from our side, uh, standardization uh, setting is critical for our competitiveness. So we have a geopolitical uh, challenge has uh, significant changes in the recent years and uh, with complex values. Um, I will not go through all the things. In the MSB, this uh, expert groups, uh, which I'm running the secretariat, we had made in the past um, uh, task force, which identified basically quite a lot of challenges on geopol uh, geopolitical challenges on standardizations and had put forward some recommendations uh, which uh, could be uh, taken up. Then uh, uh, standardization is, uh, and this is the most important thing, is a participatory process and we need some skills. So uh, you cannot just watch standardization, you need to contribute to standardizations. And uh, for contributions, you need a formal educations or vocal training and, and so on. As Ray mentioned, we had that uh, also part in the uh, in stand ICT, but also before in the joint initiative. This is a qu quick snapshot what we, uh, uh, how we're working. We have our regulatory requirements, the 1025 regulations, and uh, now a lot of regulations like artificial intelligence regulations in the trilogue. Uh, there's a lot more. I will come to that uh, later. We have in, on the international side uh, um, also quite a lot of uh, activities. I will uh, point it out later. We have a lot of policies, which uh, as outlined in the rolling plan. And uh, we have to link uh, the uh, research and innovation. So Horizon uh, uh, um, 2020 projects from the past and the Horizon Europe projects from the future and um, uh, other projects um, uh, from, from the European Commission, but also from, from the member states where standardization should, uh, can, take, uh, can be taken up. Instruments, uh, we mentioned already that we have a lot of instruments there so from the regulations. We have the, uh, the communication on standardization priorities. We have the framework programs. We have the EC mandates. Uh, we have liaisons with the uh, PPPs, MSPs, and so on. So it's quite complex in that uh, sense. And uh, we have funding. For example, Stand ICT, uh, you, you heard about that. Um, the rolling plan I mentioned already, this is uh, um, uh, an annual work program where, uh, which should help you uh, to see uh, what kind of uh, the requirements from the policy maker or the European policy maker for the different standardization. There's a sections from, on artificial intelligence and there's a sections on big data. So from 
uh, what we're doing now is uh, we, we're coming uh, together and uh, we'll define a standardization strategy. And to make the strategy, we came up in, uh, in June, uh, which was open until 9th of August, uh, uh, public consultations. And we asked several questions, one on to how to modernize the European standardization systems, uh, how to um, make a more strategic approach on global standardization systems, and uh, make the use of EU uh, industry resources to contribute to standardization activities, uh, including research and innovation, so to bridge the gap, and how to um, increase our education and skills. So from the response, we had a large response. Uh, I will not go uh, through all these uh, uh, main responses. I think uh, what we can mention is there uh, overall the what the, the four points what we mentioned was quite uh, heavily supported by the um, by the stakeholders, but there are some differences between large industry SMEs and uh, societal stakeholders. And um, so with that, we will uh, now define a, a kind of strategy and uh, we hope this will come uh, maybe in March next year, uh, we will be published. So on the regulatory side, we have a lot of fights ongoing at this moment. Uh, you heard probably in the press already, there was some agreements, uh, high level agreements on the Digital Service Act and Digital Market Act. Uh, there's artificial intelligence uh, within the Council and the European Parliament. There's a chip ups coming up. Uh, there's a directive on um, measurement for high uh, common level of cybersecurity across the Union, so NIST 2, e privacy regulations, then the European digital identity, the radio equipment harmonizations, data act, uh, which uh, comes up or supposed to come up now in December and a single market emergency instrument. On the international side, uh, what you probably have seen is uh, um, TTC, the uh, uh, Transatlantic uh, um, um, Technology um, Council with the uh, um, uh, uh, Trade and Technology Council with the US, which is basically um, or uh, to enhance trade and investment, strengthen technology and industry uh, leadership, and to boost innovation, uh, protect promotion, critical and emerging technologies and infrastructures, and uh, encourage compatible standards and regulations based on shared democratic values. So one of the parts is artificial intelligence systems, uh, where we will uh, discuss it a little bit uh, in the future. There was a Pittsburgh um, uh, um, uh, uh, press release, uh, which uh, end of September, and uh, we put on the Futurum, on the EU, Europa .eu, um, uh, um, a space about this EU trade and council where stakeholders can actually uh, put their inputs in it. But we will uh, also organize uh, some events, some public events uh, with, uh, um, with stakeholder engagements in this EU Trade and uh, Technology Council. Additionally, we have the G7. Uh, it's not G7, it's actually G10 with the EU in addition uh, Korea and um, Australia where we uh, coordinate and, uh, about, and uh, we put some information uh, sharing mechanisms uh, to take uh, work to support greater uh, coordinations on uh, digital standards, which is key for uh, for us. Again, there are some some areas like internet is uh, one of them, uh, but also AI, which uh, we we share information. A lot of bilaterals we have. We have the Indico project with Etsy. Uh, who are uh, putting up things, CISEC uh, um, and SEI. So CISEC is, uh, we have a, uh, an expert in China uh, giving information about uh, Chinese standardization. So they have a newsletter, which is open to everybody. You can subscribe to it. Uh, the same for India. 
where you can get information uh, what's happening in India. So that's a little bit an overview of what we're doing here on, on standardization inside the European Commission. It's not everything, but it's uh, as, as concise as I could put it. So back to Ray. Thank you very much, Thomas, for that. Like it's 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 amazing the the, the breadth of the, the the stakeholders and players that are involved um, in this work, like internationally. And it's 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 a, it's a big challenge. It's a big ask to try and to interact with all of it and try and coordinate it. So thank you very much for that that presentation. Uh, I'm going to hold off on on questions and until the Q and A uh, session at, at the end of our presentations. And next up, uh, of, of our speakers. Is, is Lindsay Frost, and Lindsay is, is a Chief Technologist with the NEC and, and also a member of the Etsy board. So without any further ado, uh, Lindsay, I'm gonna hand over to you, the floor is yours. You're on mute, Lindsay. Probably too many screens. <laughs> exactly, too many screens. One more try. Thank you okay. very much. And I'll try to show my screen as well. Excellent. I'll, I'll let you know when it's in full screen mode. And it's not yet full screen, but hopefully now. Perfect, Lindsay. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much, everybody. Sorry for the short uh, break. Um, first of all, I'd like to make my main thesis clear. Um, AI and big data and all the rest of it is not magic and it's the people who make the magic and that's why well, I'm here today and most of you. Mo most of this uh, short introduction is personal based on multiple roles which uh, Ray has mentioned. But um, here I am. Uh, I'm working and supported by NEC. I'm uh, a grateful member of the Stand ICT um, work and particularly AI recently. I've been active um, for a number of years in Etsy as a board member elected recent, uh, in the last uh, two periods, um, nominated as chair of the coordination group for AI in Etsy and some other technical work and also collaborating with Sen Senlec for standards and various places in the past. So what I want to um, emphasize is that there is magic, if I can say that, in AI and uh, it's an exciting place to be. We have in NEC in particular, uh, in the lab I work in, a lot of work on AI for health and personalized uh, medicine. And there's no time to go into it, uh, but uh, it's now beginning to be possible to use AI to select um, a kind of personalized uh, vaccine, which will uh, counteract exactly the tumor cells which are uh, generating in some cases of cancer. It's just starting to become feasible and just last week the first uh, phase one trials um, with NEC, there are many others active of course, uh, have, have been uh, showing good signs. That's, that's AI for people, I would say. And on the other side, there's AI for machines and machine learning. And there are huge projects like the next moon lander from, from NASA, where they need to monitor 10,000 sensors and make sure that they are not misbehaving. So that's not a case of uh, 50 engineers in, in, in Houston uh, waiting for um, bad news on, on the way to the moon. This is something where uh, it has to be real time and extremely well-trained AI. On the other side, on my role in Etsy, uh, this is standardization work where many different groups are trying to, um, let me say, connect up different activities between many different uh, players and there are many different uh, technical areas from 3D networks to um, uh, M2M or IoT uh, in direction of uh, cyber security and e-health and so on. So if you want to know a bit more about optimizing it for networks, some ethical issues, reliability issues and security issues, go to this uh, white paper which is now one year old uh, we are meant to be updating it, but uh, we've been concentrating more on the recent AI Act. Now I come to the, the key reason I'd, I'd like to engage with the audience and, and everyone on the panel, namely all the people making AI have got different mindsets and different needs, and they're all working with different, let's say, tools or outputs. 
And we heard from Thomas just a minute ago uh, from the political side, all the instruments available, but um, getting these people to line up uh, and, and uh, profitably, if I can say that, or efficiently uh, work together is uh, a key problem of our time. So we, we went in, this is now in collaboration with Stand ICT, we looked at different AI specs, classified them if they were citizen or designing or deploying or defending. I could go into depth, but I won't, about, for example, ethics. Uh, what did IEEE do? Uh, about a dozen different documents. What about uh, securing AI systems against poisoning or other problems? There are another half dozen standards from Etsy, and you could go down this long list. So the question is, uh, where do we start? Where do you start? Um, there's a bunch of uh, websites which simply list the different standards bodies. Um, I think I've got about a thousand mentioned in my PC somewhere, including working groups, which are relevant. Then there's many different databases of the work from different um, standards bodies. And this is not even including the different alliances and universities. So my key question for the audience is, uh, where did you start? Are you happy there? Um, are you familiar with all the groups you, who could be helping you or are relevant? And how hard is it for you to collaborate and get something done at the same time? Um, my conclusion, and I'd like to discuss it at some point, is we're doing pretty well at uh, the technology and the standardization, but um, connecting up the people to make it uh, available and usable is, is our current biggest issue. Thanks. Thanks very much, Lindsay, for that. It, it, it's, there's a huge volume of information there, and I, I'm always fascinated when I'm looking through the, the links with the mind map. You know, the, just the, the, the strength and depth of the of the of the uh, metadata that's that's been collected. And, and thanks very much again for all your effort within the um, AI technical work group for for um, uh, for the European Observatory for ICT standards. And next up will be. Uh, um, it's a Rama, Rama Murthy, and Rama is the CEO, founder of, of Hatha Systems, and uh, 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 we'll be delving in. Rama is going to give a more technical approach, like you know, uh, on and looking at uh, at the to the bowels of, of how how um, we can get under the hood of some some of the AI systems. So, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Rama. Um, if you uh, turn on your Yes, you have. I see the screen is shared already, and it just put it in full screen mode, and we're ready to go. Excellent, thank you. What I'm going to do is spend a bit of time talking specifically about the purpose of AI and what it is that actually feeds um, the AI machinery. And I'm going to focus specifically on. <clears throat> Sorry, Rama, the sound quality is not good. Is it possible to get closer to the microphone? And just restart, please. Uh, yes. Um, so the purpose of this, uh, this conversation is to essentially introduce a new amount of staff. Um, essentially, uh, for AI systems, the feeder for AI systems is big data, obviously. And big data is generated. <laughs> data is generated through operational um, uh, environments, right? And so you essentially have um, a, an operational environment for every organization that actually feeds into the AI machinery. Now, uh, the purpose of AI is to essentially, in enterprises such as this, the uh, Fortune 1000 entity, is to essentially have a targeted and refined customer focused branding and promotion and sales activity, yeah, and improve customer experience, as well as provide a swift and directional change to stay ahead of competition and the market pressures as well, yeah. And the needs um, include. The ability to essentially have transparency and traceability. I'm sorry, Rama. Uh, the the quality hasn't really imp improved. Is there is there any other setting you can do on your PC for for the audio? Um, sure. Just most people, most of the comments are saying it's it's very um, uh, it's the audio is very low and people can't make out what you're saying. The the rest of it is all is all the the screen is working perfectly, but I, I don't know whether it's possible to get closer to the. Microphone, or did you did you change microphones on the machine, or? Everything is great. Yeah. Um, so let me see if I can actually switch to computer. Why don't we go to another speaker? 
And Tanki, I will come back uh, and do mine. Is that okay? Okay, Rama. Yeah, sure. We can we can uh, we can switch to to um, to Amelia and 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 we can come back to you afterwards. Hopefully, if your audio has been has been sorted out by then. Um, okay. Best of luck with that. So, if you just st stop sharing, and Amelia can start sharing her screen, and and uh, we can we can ask Amelia just to to jump ahead in in the agenda. Okay, so our, our next speaker then, while, while um, Rama is, is, is trying to organize our, our audio, is Emilio uh, Tantar. Emilio is a chief a a AI um, uh, specialist at, at um, Black Swan Looks and uh, uh, heavily involved in a lot of standardization work and uh, in a lot of projects that I'm involved in as well. So without any further ado, I'll let Emilio introduce herself and, and her, her work. It's uh, over to you, Emilio. Thank you, Ray. Um, I uh, deeply appreciate being present here and be part of this important exchange, especially for SME and for the AI journey. So I'm Emilia Tanta, I'm the Chief Data and AI Artificial, AI Artificial Intelligence Officer of Black Swan Looks, and I'm also co-convener of the ad hoc working group um, AI Conformity Assessment in SEN and SELEC GTC21. I'm the Head of Delegation President of the Luxembourg National Mirror Committee on Artificial Intelligence. Um, what I will uh, enclose today is an, our e European artificial intelligence SME journey to conformity assessment. Um, as a statement of purpose, the purpose of the hearing document and of the presentation is to offer a high level view on aspects within AI standardization and EU AI legislative frameworks. We are compiling a number of normative documents and articles on AI with a main focus on societal and business related implication. Of course, the presentation is intended for dissemination within the limits of the BDVI members only and where applicable public domain external materials are credited and the links are provided to allow referring to the respective originating works. This is a bit of statement of purpose, what you'll hear next. I will start with a small question for you. So you will see here we have a QR code. And my question to you relate with to what uh, Thomas presented. Is AI a regulated field in Europe? So you will have time to respond till the end of the presentation, and then we'll see the results. There's a question mark. Is it a regulated field? What do we know? So what we do know so far is that we have artificial intelligence facing a lot of challenges. We have general artificial intelligence standardization challenges, and I will namely um, mention here the ESG uh, and the ethics for AI. But we have also challenges of AI standardization and the actionability. So as an SME, we are interested in standards to make them actionable and to see how they directly impact our business. But the first challenges are more general. So on the general side, we have AI which is highly performed. But I will give you here another funny example. Um, we had uh, Lee Sedul, which lost his title to a computer. But when we think about it, uh, this computer was fueled by um, 50,000 times more energy than Lee Sedul was using. He was merely using 20 watts. But AlphaGo, by contrast, burned an estimated one megawatt of energy. And this for a game. So thinking about ESG, environment, sustainability, our major societal challenges, and governance, of course, the computer uh, won and Lissadol lost, but there's always a trade-off. If we take, uh, and this is just an example of a, a computer, it's not uh, the most important or the most um, relevant one, but it still gives an idea of the environmental impact. Uh, if we look at well, AlphaGo Zero, it generated 96 tons of CO2 over 40 days for the training period of AI. So this amounts uh, roughly to 1,000 hours of air travel or a carbon footprint of 23 American homes. So that's an issue. There is an environmental challenge of AI. We can optimize and we can always find an approximate solution with AI, but is it worth it? So European Union has a rolling plan and Thomas presented that for 2021. 
it raised the concern that ICT at the general level is currently one of the fastest growing greenhouse gas emitting and energy management sectors. Uh, you, when we look at AI, the environmental impact, it resides mainly on training. And this defines the sustainability of AI. But the topic is rather complex and is not yet well defined. We know that sustainability of AI currently is focused on sustainable data sources, on power supplies, on infrastructures, and the usage of uh, therein. And these are ways following these three characteristics of measuring and reducing the carbon footprint from training and or tuning of an AI algorithm, what we call now these artificial intelligence algorithms. So this is an open challenge. Other open challenges more general and maybe less directly relevant for um, an SME or standardization in general, but still of uh, important concern is ethics. We had an important work from Virginia Dignum and her colleagues um, on ethics from norms to implementation. This um, notion, it comes from our own values. Each individual has its own values coming from its education, cultural background, and its uh, own life experiences. Then it interprets these values into norms. And these norms are generally valid for a specific geographical region, for a specific culture, and so on. But in order to make these norms, which are part of definition of ethics, concrete, action, we need to reduce them to functionalities. And in this case, when functionalities are defined, which are derived from the ethics of the values, then the norms, and we go to functionalities, then we could work on ethics for AI. But we are reducing them to functionalities. And this is not an easy problem. The European Commission had a high level expert group on artificial intelligence, which defined in 2019, ethics guideline for trustworthy AI. And I will not uh, remain on that. You have the reference. And I think most of you are aware of this definition. It was not the only effort in the area. Quantifying ethics was defined by Altai. So after this uh, um, guideline um, assessment framework was also issued by the high level expert commission. And in parallel by the House of Lords, by the OECD, by UNESCO, and different other industrial uh, organizations or associations, unions, and so far and so forth. AI ethics, a sole purpose in standardization, there are no mature initiatives yet, although uh, associations like IEEE uh, issued ECPI, a framework for assessing standards, and there was an attempt by IEC having a, a ECG 10 on autonomous uh, artificial intelligence systems. The AI ethics as part of standardization for AI application system services, they are present at an international perspective, just for your um, reference, at the ISO IEC GTC 1 level, GTC means Joint Technical Committee, in subcommittee 42, which is artificial intelligence, but it's not the sole purpose, so it is present. And um, in Sen Senelec, Sen and Senelec Joint Technical Committee 21 at the European perspective, it is not a direct scope, but it's still included in the definitions. Um, according to the OECD, one definition of AI systems you have here starts from context, uh, where we provide data and input to a system, an AI model is generated and task and output is provided again in the context. This is one of the definition. So you see several challenges, ESG, ethics, but they are quite high level challenges. So if we go to the challenges of AI standardization, and their actionability, uh, one of the main challenges in the um, upcoming context of the European artificial intelligence legislative framework is the certification conformity assessment consideration. Uh, for your consideration, I will just mention how conformity assessment is structured 
according to CASCO. We have the object of conformity assessment. What we can assess is an AI system, product, or process. This is one category, or a large category to several subcategories. One person could be assessed for conformity assessment, and this will be further the one which will uh, provide a testing for conformity assessment. And we can have an organization here. We have body, but it should be an organization or a management system. So organizational level, we could have conformity assessment of AI. And then we have three ways of conducting conformity assessment. First party, self-assessment. So the manufacturer or supplier, um, the person organization that provides the object of conformity assessment. You have definition of object on the left, right hand side. A second party, it will be a user or purchaser. And the third party, this is the certification. It is performed by an independent body. So it is a personal body that is independent of the one that provides the object of conformity assessment. So we can have um, this scheme set up voluntarily, self-regulation, and accreditation only applies to third party conformity assessment bodies. So these are more practical, pragmatical challenges. Another challenge that comes with conformity assessment, and here we provide it just for illustration purposes, they are not the most relevant or the most uh, not worthy um, tools. There are tools to support standardization. If we want to perform an assessment, we need to do some tests. So we have several standardization initiatives, and we mentioned the ISO and IEC Joint Technical Committee 1, Subcommittee 42. Uh, there are nine published standards, 23 under development. We had the ethics in autonomous and AI applications specific for ESC that was already dismissed. And at, at the European level, we have the ETC, which is securing artificial intelligence. So it's, uh, uh, Lindsay will explain more on that. Uh, it has a special uh, purpose for the moment. And since Electro and Technical Committee 21 on AI, it kicked off on June first 2021 it should be noted that at the international level we started even in 2017 so subcommittee 42 started in 2017. so now in support of this standardization when we want to do some testing there are tools and uh, the tools which are existing on the market they are provided by big players so here you see traceability safety transparency fairness and bias by different players not that many SMEs are present in providing this kind of tool. But this is just uh, uh, initial efforts and uh, there is still place for SME to develop. And uh, the window of opportunity is there. So as an SME, I will provide you also what I see as uh, European artificial intelligence enablers. The first and foremost uh, uh, important effort is the one mentioned by Ray, the Stand ICT and European Observatory, because this allows you to navigate uh, the complex landscape of standardization and especially of artificial intelligence standardization. Besides this, and I would advise you to follow the reports which are regularly issued and keep yourself updated with that. For SMEs, we have the European Digital SME Alliance. There are two focus groups which I find of interest. The first one is the focus group on AI, of which I'm part of the steering committee. And the second one is the working group on standards. Both of them, they support SMEs to get involved and uh, be part of the artificial intelligence efforts in Europe and standardization efforts. One other important tool that could enable SMEs to bring um, uh, stand standardization tools, but not only to create AI for Europe, uh, there is one stop shop for uh, UAI, which is the AI for Europe.eu. This is the European AI on demand platform. This provides access to top notch AI researchers, experimentation, and common, exper common tools, uh, common data sets. It provides latest trends on policy, ethics, and social impact of AI. And this is with no cost involved for SMEs. And this is a unique platform worldwide, which regroups the entire European AI ecosystem. So you have access to skills, you can ask questions, you can uh, get trained, and you can ha you have access to experimentation tools 
and also a common uh, ground of exchange with the community. Um, that being said, maybe we'll have a look of your vision on the AI as a regulated field in Europe. So you'll allow me to just switch for one moment the screen. So I'll just stop sharing for one moment and we'll share the voting. If you didn't do so, maybe I should let for one more moment the QR code so you can engage. Yeah, is it is it possible to post the link for the um, uh, for the QR code, Emilia? Yes, sure. So you have I think that might help, and we can maybe come back to it uh, at the at the Q and A, or maybe just before the end of the Q and A. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. So I will post this. I will close here, and I will post afterwards in the chat, okay. and we can continue. So thank you for your attention and being. Uh, present. Um, three key takeaways uh, for closing. Uh, AI standardization is ongoing since 2017. It is an enabler for the UAI legislation, which is a risk-based approach. And the AI, this technology is an enabler for all sectors. And I do thank you for following so far. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Amelia. Um, uh, and congratulations, actually, on your appointment to the steering committee as well um, uh, yesterday. Um, for, uh, because the focus group on AI and the digital SME alliance work like you know, is, is pivotal to pivotal pivotal to the, the uh, development of the of standardization work in the European Commission as well. Um, hopefully that Rama now has had uh, uh, resolved her audio issues. So uh, without any further ado, I'll hand you straight away back over to uh, the CEO of Hatha Systems, uh, uh, Rama Murthy. Uh, I can see your screen and if you put in full screen mode, Rama, and hopefully the audio has, uh, has resolved. I can see full screen now, thank you. We can't hear you. Are you on mute, Rama? Yes, I'm on mute. Is that okay? Can you Perfect. hear me now? Excellent. Okay, so um, the, the previous speakers spoke uh, to you about AI in a very broad way uh, from a standardization perspective. They also addressed that AI can be implemented across robotics, across space, across multiple things. My focus specifically is going to be around the use of AI and the need for the integrity and the quality of data and accuracy of data in AI in standard Fortune 1000 entities that have large scale enterprises and what their purpose is for the use of AI and what is necessary and what is a gap that's missing, okay, from a standards perspective. So um, first and foremost, the purpose of AI for Fortune 1000 entities, whether it's an Amazon, whether it's a JP Morgan, or whether it's a, you know, an insurance entity, or, or it's a, you know, Alberta Culver, right? That the target and the idea basically is that they want to have refined customer focused branding, promotion, and sales. Yeah. They want to have improved customer experience as well. And they will need to have swift directional changes that stay ahead of competitive and market pressures that continue to plague these sort of organizations. Right. But the need for having that kind of agility is that they absolutely need to have traceability of customer behavior and actions and how they tie into business operations. As much as 80% of customer experience is how well um, the, the underlying business operations runs and how it interacts with that particular customer. Okay? And the business operations today is as much as 80 to 95% of it is actually running in software, right? And it requires traceability and transparency so that you have an understanding of how the operations is run and how the underlying software mechanisms are actually running that particular set of operations. So uh, what I wanna do is introduce what I'm calling the, the integrated knowledge stack. And it'll sort of come to, to fruition as I go through the slide deck. Uh, but the stack essentially is the layers of knowledge that is retrievable across technical, functional and operational layers. And I'll define those things for the purposes of providing comprehensive traceability and transparency for digital transformation, for operational risk management, for AI and ML activities that all of these organizations are going through, okay? The focus of the stack is to show the link also between human and software run operations, whether residing on-premise, in the cloud, whether static or dynamic as well, 
Okay. The definitions, technical layer is how the system is built to deliver the functional layers uh, required, including which language, meaning the data flows, the control flows, the call maps and the screens and the interfaces, architectures and data structures, et cetera. The functional layer is where each individual application or system that is actually running a portion or a segment of business process or how data is actually shaped through a what, what big data analytics folks call the data lineage, we're calling term lineage, okay? And we'll define that a little bit more um, as we go forward. And so the, the next layer is basically looking at business operational layer, which integrates these things together. It integrates what the human interaction is to the screen, and it integrates basically what the individual applications are doing and how they're tied together. So you have a, an end-to-end -end understanding of operations and an end-to-end -end understanding of the data as it's flowing through that operations as it feeds into whether it's inside of the AI machinery or whether it's actually in the enterprise feeding the AI, AI machinery, okay? And there is a component of static analysis. Think of it as a Google mapping of your operation, right? And then dynamic analysis. Think of it as like basically if you have a Google map of your, you know, of your map uh, of where you were, wherever you're going in a GPS environment, think of it as the overlay of traffic on top of that. Dynamic analysis can achieve that, you know, as it provide that overlay on top of the, the, the static analysis. So let's actually talk a little bit more about these different layers. The layers that we've defined in this international or sorry, integrated knowledge stack is that it's layer zero through layer six. It's granular. It provides you a very specific understanding of each of the different layers, you know, what it is that it's delivering. Layer zero is at the very lowest level, looking at call maps and screens and all of these elements that make up the mechanisms of software. The architecture layer shows you how they're all interlinked together, right? And then layer, layer two, which is a functional layer, now we're actually at the operational layer, the business layer, right? At the business layer, you're looking at things like data and you're looking at things like, um, you know, business rules that are needed and term lineage and business process. Term lineage, unlike data lineage, when you're in the actual application environment, you get to see the intrinsic and extrinsic characteristics of data. That means you get the origination of data, the termination of data, the access to data, the, the, and the storage of data. You get to see um, how the data is shaped and how the data is transformed. Uh, an example, a simple example would be taking a look at something like an international wire transfer, right? You want to be able to know that when you're actually going through that segmentation and understanding of the pieces that actually go through and show you where your money is actually being transferred and how it's being processed through that to get to the end point. If it starts in the UK at a TD bank and it goes to NatWest on the other end in the UK, how do you know that that whole flow is exacting and has, that the data has integrity to it, right? Those become feeders to your AI engines to understand how do you actually make sure that you're actually processing the data accurately and, and with integrity. Uh, same thing with business process, yeah? And so the, the stack is essentially providing that scope and definition of, and it's a new approach because there hasn't been anything defined yet as a framework for how analytical data can be utilized in the operational world to, to ensure data has integrity, data has accuracy, data has you know, um, yeah, privacy and security attached to it. So um, the integrated knowledge stack and how it sort of establishes itself in terms of the landscape of customers, right? Or not customers, but vendors. Um, Hoppa Systems is, you know, a company that basically has done a full integrated version of it in, this, in this, the, the static analysis world. But there are a plethora of entities that have actually been in this space for a while, but they're providing very discrete views, myopic views into what is going on from an operational standpoint. And what we need is some co you know, cooperation and collaboration that goes on with these entities to essentially start putting static and dynamic together, to start putting the fact that you have lower level analysis like code level analysis that are very detailed common weakness enumerations that can actually tie into a Google mapping. So there's a lot of collaboration work that can be done if the stack is actually started, is applied by uh, various enterprises um, around the world. And uh, essentially it also ties into governance and operational effectiveness and also customer satisfaction. So essentially with but the idea of AI is the idea of AI is basically you have 
you know, uh, uh, a, an AI engine, but if the, the quality of the data that's actually coming into the AI engine is inaccurate, then you essentially have garbage in, garbage out. And we have to fix the core issue that is right now get a, a large gaping hole within enterprises today, which is essentially how do we actually go about providing operational transparency so you have that agility, so you have that accuracy, so that the data feeds that are going into the big data analytics world and, and the repository of data that's there that is actually feeding the AI engine is actually accurate so that the AI output is actually accurate as well. So that is essentially what I'm presenting here today. And that's it. Fantastic, Rama. Uh, a huge amount of, uh, of, of material in that presentation to chew on. Um, brilliant. Um, okay, so uh, th and thanks very much for, for sorting out the audio problem as well. Uh, now we can uh, go move on to the Q&A session uh, of, the, of our part of the session. And I'd invite all of our, our guests to, to, uh, to, to share their, uh, their screens again. And we'll have a look to see what we have in, in the, the pipeline for, for for uh, questions. And I see one coming in here, uh, Sina has posted it in, into the chat, and it comes from our, our good friend and colleague, Rigo Venning. And uh, Rigo works in, 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 in the W3C as uh, legal counsel, and he has a question, or a, a comment maybe uh, on, um, towards what Lindsay was talking about, the interoperability, uh, well, not interoperability, but the, but the, uh, the, 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 the amount of players, like you know, the fact that there's so many uh, expert groups out there. Uh, let, you, you were talking about Lindsay, you know, the, the, the doing the work on the landscape of AI and the, the, the proliferation of standards experts groups, which you may want to pick up on now. Um, and Rigo is saying, like you know, uh, in his in his humble opinion, that this could be due to the lack of metadata. Um, and uh, I know that, that, that Rigo is keenly interested in working on metadata and data standards uh, and, and particular in particular in relation to uh, data spaces. So maybe you want to just pick up on that, like a, that, uh, that this lack of metadata may lack to, lead to the lack of cooperation between uh, the, these expert groups, this proliferation of, proliferation of expert groups. Lindsay. Okay, I'll take that broadly. That is, um, Every group is like a, a bird, birds of a feather operation. They, they learn to talk with each other and communicate quickly and easily, and they develop their own language, uh, even if it is based on English uh, often. Um, and uh, by, bad luck for the Australians like me who, who uh, stumble into a French or a, a Spanish uh, CSTO. But the, uh, the trouble with metadata is that you have to agree on terms, and that's where a lot of time gets put in what is artificial intelligence? Thomas could probably tell us how many man years went into that one at, for the AI Act, uh, just to, to agree on something which was not um, immediately shot at by, with big cannons. So I think, yes, metadata is a big help. Advertising what you've got in a way that others know you've got it uh, and are prepared to share. That's another great one. Linked Open Data has been doing this for years. Uh, the Commission has been supporting it um, for some kinds of data, uh, even with directives for, for um, government related data, uh, quite a lot. Uh, it's gradually getting support, but it's like uh, the United Nations. You start with some motions in favour of something and then uh, maybe five years or ten years later you start to see not only the promises of action, but actually the action. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I mean again, there's this standardization of terms and definitions that that's required and if we don't get agreement on that at the start then that just leads to a I think it it, it, it tends to lead to this proliferation of, of, of extra groups and everybody having their own uh, view of of, every, uh, of of what they think is is the the state of the art and and, and actually what what I'll do is in terms of that 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 quality I mean just to go back to to, to Rama because she mean she, she mentioned it as part of her for presentation and just maybe to expand on that because the, the quality of the data that we're dealing with in terms of AI systems, actually in digital systems in, gen, in general, and, and, the, and the, the ICT ecosystem that we all live in, in quality, data quality is really, really important. And, the, and when you're dealing with AI systems, if, if you were talking about garbage in and garbage out. So the, the, we need this good quality data input in order for the AI systems to be anyway effective and, and um, uh, productive in their operation. So what are the main issues and challenges in relation to that problem? Well, I think most enterprises are struggling significantly because 
there is a shift going on right now where there is a mixed mode of, uh, of essentially um, uh, having an enterprise solution and a cloud or enterprise operation and um, or on-premise and cloud, right? Additionally, they have legacy operations and legacy systems and also modern systems and a huge uh, push toward uh, doing really innovative new microservice-based, AI-based, all kinds of techniques that are being utilized to speed up the process of doing more client-facing activities as well. So there are gaps in how operations are run. And when there are significant gaps and mismatches, it really requires an understanding of what is my current state and how do I actually look at that current state and really try to move you know, from where I am today, where I have significant gaps that don't have operational effectiveness. And I need to make sure my data has the integrity and the accuracy that it needs as I move toward the future. Because if I don't have that transparency, I don't have that agility. If I don't have that agility, I'm never going to be competitive with my marketplace, yeah? And so it's a real challenge for folks. And this is the fundamental reason why having something like an integrated knowledge stack actually gives um, organizations, not vendors, Organizations like the JP Morgans of the world and or the, the, the Amazons of the world that are running in a, in a B2C or B2B activities to really have a, here's what my baseline looks like. And I want to know that as I bring all of this knowledge that is across the various layers, it has to be integrated, it has to be correlated, it has to be traceable. It has to have the ability to deliver root cause. If my data is incorrect, I have to know where I can go to essentially see where my problem is. And it's challenging today because it's mostly it's this, this discrete and it's uh, there are lots of gaps and there's a lot of manual labor going on. And so that's the challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and I, I think that this with the, with the proliferation of, of, of AI systems, like we need to have this openness, this transparency. We need to build trust. You know, trust is, is going to be yeah. key here. And I think standards is a, is, is, is a key way of doing this. And I'm going to come back to Thomas on this because, I mean, Thomas would have a view of, of uh, yeah, a lot of the uh, European projects in particular that the Commission supports, uh, which would support, because this is really keyly important for SMEs, you know, if they want to survive in, in, in the market. So standards for SMEs is really important. And, and, and with the projects that are running, uh, they, there, there's a lot of them, you know, which are supporting their engagement and, and, and I mean, to standard CD is one of them. Like, and, and that is the case. Like, the, the commission is doing their best to increase that visibility and increase that engagement. Do you want to pick up on that, Thomas? Yeah, what we're doing is actually um, the engagement and standardization is quite important. And uh, just to the previous speaker, I would also say uh, here management standards are extremely important in that sense. And uh, we, we see a lot of management standards now in uh, GTC1 or in ISO. So the uh, ISO 42000 series, which will be uh, soon um, published. I hope there will be some, uh, some more uh, clear guidance, I would say, in the, in, inside this work. But uh, the first draft probably is not exactly what you're looking for uh, as such, but uh, I hope this will come up uh, in the future. From the commission also, we uh, what uh, Rama said, uh, this is extremely important uh, to, because we need uh, transparency for the whole things. And on, on the transparency side, which is a, a essential requirements from us, from the legislative side, um, we need to have some instruments to, to, to follow on that. And uh, next year, we will do some uh, new uh, standardization working items in uh, GTC1. We're not sure exactly where, probably SC42, but it might be also in, SC, in other SC27 uh, on cybersecurity, where this needs to be, uh, I would say, addressed. Now to the engagements of, uh, of people. Uh, yes, uh, I see there from our perspective, uh, I think uh, the European Commission uh, at this moment, uh, we supporting what we call Annex 3 organizations. So uh, Annex, which is the voice of the consumers, um, uh, ETUC, uh, which is the unions and um, the, the environment and others. Um, through uh, certain grants so that they can go to the European standardization organizations um, and represent the voices. What we see on international standardizations, which is also true in GTC1, 
that uh, societal stakeholders is actually absent. And uh, also SMEs are not really heavily involved in that sense. So uh, that's why we had, uh, as was outlined at the beginning, Ray, uh, the stand ICT, where the majority of funding goes uh, to SMEs or to, uh, uh, to individuals basically uh, contributing to standard population. And uh, we are uh, seeing that, um, uh, and we're giving, I, I would say, uh, some kind of uh, funds uh, uh, and support uh, on the international side. So we are, we are quite um, aware that there are some issues. And uh, in the next strategy, we will also address a little bit more, uh, which is coming up next year. Absolutely, yeah. No, I, I, think, I think that's keyly important. And it, the, again, it just it raises uh, the, um, the, the, the need for standardization, not, uh, and, and, and not just that it's available at a, at a political level or at a, an inter, a governmental level, but down at the, at, at the ground level, like you know, for, for startups and SMEs to engage in the market, how important standardization is. And if you have a standard, then to, to, trying to conform to that standard, so to get your business aligned so that you that, that international trade, it makes sense. It, 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 it is, is a key thing for an SME, and this conformity assessment. And Emilio, I'll bring you, Emilio, I'll bring you in on this. Like, this has a particular impact on SMEs, and, and from your 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 work with with the focus group on AI and digital SME alliance, maybe you'd have a, a comment on that aspect of it. Yeah, indeed, Ray. The reason that we engage with conformity assessment is that we realize that the European artificial intelligence legislation, which was foreseen in the AI strategy since 2018 will bring conformity assessment to table, so legislative uh, request. And we knew that legislative requests will be supported technically by the European standardization efforts. Uh, one strategy that we adopted and we recommend to all SMEs is the benefit from the local national support of the national standardization bodies. Here we have Ilnas in Luxembourg, which tremendously supported, trained, uh, and now you have, you are leading the Stand ICT initiative and you have uh, their more structural effort which will come for SMEs. But it was really important for us to get trained. I come from the research area, so I was not aware of standardization efforts and I was not uh, trained for that. That was the first uh, pillar. And conformity assessment, uh, as you mentioned it and some of the European Commission officers mentioned, we need to be wise and standardized because an SME, uh, can't afford to follow the directions which are given by big industry, which can afford cost of conformity assessment. So um, this is the right moment to engage. And also because technologically uh, we'll have uh, the AI processes which will be defined. And if we are not, uh, um, let's say aligned with this AI processes, I'm coming from uh, an industry which is uh, highly regulated. So we are applying in the data which needs to be interoperable, which is highly sensitive data. And in our case, we already face compliance, so compliance costs. So we, in order to reduce the further costs, we need to engage and understand the process and understand the European specificity, which is translated in the international standards, because we, European standardization bodies will adopt international standards, but they can be adopted also with modifications. So we need to be sure that the European values uh, are there, but all in the same time to keep interoperability of data, because we use data from different, in our case, from different um, sensors, wearables, so they come from different vendors worldwide. So we need to ensure also this uh, uh, international uh, dimension. Uh, I see here Lindsay had a comment, uh, so maybe I will just pass it to Lindsay so he has time to answer. Go ahead, Lindsay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, briefly, thanks. I wanted to address the interoperability because uh, on the one hand, it's always raised as one of the advantages of standards that uh, the different um, modules in, in a stack or the different companies in, a, in a, an alliance or the different players in the market can, can aim for their strengths and not try to do the whole thing. On the other hand, getting that interoperability is a hell of a job and SMEs or even big companies often say, well, to hell with that, I'll just do what I need today and get to the market and then um, we'll, we, we'll see what happens. So I'm seeing a big trouble uh, hitting us 
uh, because there are many, many players making uh, truly powerful and, and, uh, and uh, interesting AI systems. And the only time I've seen them actually doing interoperability is moving data around or what was said about metadata. Um, there's a, a true common need for data which is clearly defined. You may not want to uh, pay a lot of money for it or it may be privacy protected, but at least you know it's out there. And so these, these uh, what can you say? This um, low level, um, I will say fertilizer, uh, because data is not the new oil, it's, it's a fertilizer for the AI uh, tree. That one, I think everyone agrees on, but um, all the rest on top of that is, is still uh, waiting for a real uh, motivator to get the, 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 the handshaking going between different companies, different parts of the stack, etc. So find a way to make that happen. And I think many of our worries will uh, reduce or at least become more visible. <laughs> Absolutely. It is fertilizer. I prefer actually oxygen, uh, Lindsay. Uh, uh, I don't like oil and I don't like fertilizer. I prefer oxygen. Okay, the, good. We'll go with that. It's the oxygen for the digital transformation. And, and I just came up on a talk and I was, I was doing yesterday as well. So, it was, so it's an interesting one, but I 100% agree. And I think that there's, uh, there, I see another question in the chat there as well, which we get to get to as well. But uh, this gives the, the important, and I think there's this, this information and education aspect to what we do as well where we need to inform people um because it, it can't be just left, left to legislators and, and to regulators and to even to standards bodies just pr producing the standards we all have i think an onus to to bring some education there and again because the parliament is bringing out new new regulations and new acts like the ai act and the data governance act and and startups and smes are not going to know what implication that has for them so i think the work that, that and actually lindsay and emilia are involved in this of mapping the standards landscape to the AI Act and 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 uh, various other other uh, instruments that are coming out. I like guess it's very very important work. Question in the chat is is the and this is probably everybody want to get in on this one. Probably Rama first, but uh, uh, do we need liability for negligence in a machine learning trained with bad data quality? Okay, so uh, uh, how would we establish? causality so i think from a causality point of view probably ram i'm sure as as has, has views on that but in terms of legislation and regulation and i'm sure thomas would have views on that and lindsay and amelia so we start with rama just in terms of you know um uh, the, the need for what what if the if there is garbage in and 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 the ml is trained with this garbage and then that causes a bad output um what's your view on that one rama you're on a mute, Rama, at the moment. Sorry, of course there's liability, right? The liability exists whether you want to introduce liability concerns or not. The, the issue basically becomes, you know, are organizations today just transferring that liability with insurance and other sort of mechanisms, or do they actually want to solve the problem, right? It goes back to what Lindsay was saying and others are saying, which is essentially, if you have your metadata correctly and understand exactly how your data is actually being processed, and you have that transparency of your operation, then you're going to be able to achieve that reduction in liability by, by actually you know, implemented, implementing it based on what we have defined as the, the stack, for example. And so I'll leave it there. Excellent. Uh, and in terms of like, I mean, when you have that liability, then you're gonna, people are gonna ask for, well, how do you measure that? Uh, how do you regulate against yeah. it? How do you legislate against it? Like how, how do you, do, how, do you how do you comply to how exactly. do you comply to things? How do you regulate it? How do you audit it? And yeah. if you don't have those mechanisms in place, with then that's going to come from having transparency. Exactly, yeah. and it brings in all that conformity assessment that that media was talking about, and, and the 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 the, exactly. uh, the regulations and acts coming out of the out of the, out of the parliament via via the European Commission's um, trying to. Uh, uh, to uh, provide the instruments to stabilize the whole market, because in the absence of any um, standardization, you have a sort of chaotic uh, chaotic systems. Um, another question there, I need to wrap up quite quickly, but I'm not sure. Lindsay, do you want to have a look at that one there, interoperability versus unification? This looks like another Rigo Venning uh, question, actually. I think Rigo has, has been very active on, on the, uh, he didn't put his name to this one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. well, sorry, Cena didn't put his name to it, but it looks like a regal vending. Lindsay, do you want to take that? Okay. Um, we're organizing, again, people. And if you try to unify them into one big group, 
uh, you'll make as many enemies as you make friends and it will take you um, five years to get everyone cooperating. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you let everybody run around and play their own games, you'll get nowhere in that same five years. Somewhere in the middle uh, is the sweet po uh, spot. And I just remind everybody when they introduce cellular networks, maybe some of the audience are old enough to remember that, um, there were like five or six different cellular competing network systems. They could not interact. Yeah. And it took, and it took uh, really uh, almost a decade to focus on interoperability and, uh, of competing systems, CDMA, if you remember, and uh, very yeah. common in, in the US still. But we eventually got there by getting more and more, uh, what can you say, uh, interworking gateways or proxies or uh, connection points. Uh, in other places, they talk about minimal interoperability. And I think this is the only way in the, our global and highly digital ecosystems we're going to manage this this job. We can't do it by top down. There's no king of the planet. Yeah, I think the interfacing and providing interfaces which allows for existing systems to communicate like it's key to this. I think that's where yeah. we're yeah. coming from. Yeah. And that gets and back that, to we, metadata, yes. Exactly, and it gets back to metadata, and we, we all agree with that anyway. Um, look, we're running out of time rapidly. I mean, did we, I, we could just talk forever on these topics, and, uh, and that's unfortunate, but we, we're, we're, we're at our 90-minute limit. So what I'm going to adv adv um, ask at this stage is for each of our um, uh, guests just to, to provide a little takeaway comment for the audience. And uh, so what, what sort of sort of key takeaway point from, from each of their talks, and I'm going to go through uh, uh, Rama first, uh, then Amelia, and then uh, Lindsay, and then Thomas. So Rama, quick, quick uh, takeaway point from yourself for the audience uh, on, on our topics today. You're on mute again, Rama. This is, this is the key Sorry. word. This is the key phrase for <laughs> 2021. You're on mute. <laughs> yes, um, just very simply, uh, the knowledge stack that I proposed ever so briefly, I've actually posted the presentation deck as well as a white paper associated with this. So uh, the folks who are attending can actually download and read. Uh, that's probably the only thing that I wanna say. Um, I think that you, you have a pretty good understanding of what my position is regarding um, data and the integrity and the, 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 um, the accuracy of data. So I'll leave it at that. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Rama. Uh, Amelia, your takeaway comment. Um, my takeaway comment will relate with the fact that in Europe we have a responsible approach towards artificial intelligence. And the question is not if we should have this legislative um, framework. Um, the question is how do we how we should handle approximate techniques? They are approximate techniques. So the only uh, reasonable way to treat it is by putting a control framework, which is a legislative framework. Now, I do not see the legislative framework as a constraint. I see it more as an opportunity to have a long-term development of AI because we feel what we don't understand. And once we see that it doesn't meet the expectations, so it's going rogue, we will not trust it. So it goes out of the market. I see the European artificial intelligence legislation as an enabler and standardization as a really needed effort in providing also the European vision on standards and including the European values. So, Thanks very much, Emilia. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Lindsay, your takeaway point? Uh, the point is there's a lot of people working. They publish a lot of what they're doing. Um, the only way to really get involved is to try to amalgamate efforts and gradually join up. And uh, I think all the links in all the presentations people made today will help. Um, other than that, uh, I think we need a big chat room. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, Lindsay. And finally, Thomas, your takeaway point for today's session. Yeah, thanks. I think it was a quite interesting session. From the European Commission, there's coming up quite a lot of legislative uh, approaches, like Digital Single Market Act, Digital, Digital Service Act, uh, also the artificial intelligence. Then there's the e-privacy, which is also linked to all this activity. And uh, on the cybersecurity, there's also some uh, some uh, NIST two and uh, new new activities going on, uh, including also the European digital identity. All this is a little bit interlinked. Um, this will be now uh, heavy discussions uh, between the legislator to get everything through. Uh, we see this is like good progress, especially already on the um, DMA and DSA. 
And, um, but nevertheless, in, before this is going into uh, production, I would say, uh, we need to have standards to give the, uh, uh, to, to enforce the things. Uh, and uh, we see uh, probably, for example, the um, Artificial Intelligence Act needs to have a transition period in, for the enforcements until 2025. So the things will not be uh, not be solved in the uh, in in the short term. Uh, needs to be a lot of work on standardization. Fantastic. Thanks very much uh, to all of our guests, all of our expert speakers uh, for today's session. Uh, it really is. It's been a pleasure for me uh, to 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 moderate the session. And just it remains just to thank uh, Lindsay Frost, uh, NEC Laboratories, and Etsy Board. Rama Murthy, CEO and founder of Hathay Systems, Thomas Reibe, Senior Officer at DG Connect and for the European Commission, and Emilia Tantar, uh, Chief AI and Data Officer for Black Swan Luxembourg. Thank you all for joining us today. Thanks for, uh, for exceptional, uh, interesting presentations and for the, the Q&A uh, at the end. Thanks to the European BDVA um, uh, and the, the European Big Data Value Forum uh, personnel and, and BDVA for hosting this and for providing all the background and for the teams that organized it. Um, and thanks to all the audience for the participation as well. See you all soon. Take care. God bless. Goodbye.